So good morning, everyone. I guess we'll get started. My name is Liz, and I'm in the admissions office. Um, I'm one of the reps. You probably have all been working with different reps, Andrea or Emerson or Elise or Jason. And I want to congratulate you on your acceptances. For those of you who have applied and been accepted, that's awesome. We're psyched. And we hope that you choose Ross School. This morning, um, we have with us Jen Cross, who is um, our Dean of Visual Arts. And she's going to talk for a little bit. And we also have Sophie Walter, who's an 11th grader. She's in the same grade as my son. Um, in addition to being in the admissions office, I also do communications for the school, um, graphic design. So any of the things that you've seen that are kind of like advertisements or brochures or whatever um i probably did them no this is um virtual visits to raw school and oh hi liz we can hear you now <laughs> oh, sorry. That's i'm okay. sorry that's I great um and so um i'm also a ross parent so i have a son who's graduated from ross and is in college and i also have a son who is an 11th grader and um so I'm coming at, you know, from two different perspectives, but I'm also an artist. So that's why I really wanted to be in on this visual arts um, conversation. So I'm going to let Jen Cross take it away. And um, as I said, we're recording the session and any questions you can type in the chat bar and we'll address them as we go along. But Jen's going to talk about the visual arts program. Okay, I'm going to just try to get my PowerPoint up here. If you um just uh, indulge me for a minute. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to just kind of run through um, the Ross School art curriculum and I'm going to highlight a few things and um, uh, show you kind of the breadth of it. One thing that you should know about Ross School is no matter um, uh, who you are, everyone takes integrated arts at the Ross School. It's considered part of the core classes and we do it in conjunction to the study of history. So in ninth grade, for example, students will make their own Leonardo books as they're studying the Renaissance. So I'm going to just show you some slides um, that reflect that project. So, you know, the whole idea of looking at art and the history of art as we study cultural history is that art is a great way for us to understand the values of a, of a society. Um, it really helps us to understand um, you know, the narrative, that particular part of the world or culture that we're studying. You know, it gives you clues to what's going on. And um, for example, this great painting, which is called the School of Athens, uh, can be dissected to understand what the Renaissance were all about, how it was this retrieval of classical knowledge, how there was this intersection between science and mathematics and philosophy. And this is something that the whole uh, team of teachers in the ninth grade will talk about together. So art and art history are not isolated as a separate thing, but totally connected to what you're studying. Like for example, one of the things students will do when they're making their own Leonardo books is they'll look at how Leonardo would create monsters. And here's a quote from Leonardo. When he would create a monster, he would look at nature. He very much believed in observation. So you look at something, you figure out how to, you figure out what the world is by observing it. And if you think about that in context to the Renaissance, it was really a time where man, you know, humanity was not just accepting what had been uh, thought about before, but they wanted to discover for themselves. And that's why you get the great innovations in science and anatomy, understanding medicine, all these things happened because um, the Renaissance man wanted to find things out for himself. So by looking at real creatures, you can see how, you know, mammals, uh, you know, are structured. And this imagination came into it too with these monsters. So his advice was to take the head of one animal with the wing of another animal and put it together. So we asked our students to do the same thing. And these are examples by ninth graders. And you see also there's quotes by Leonardo that are, um, that they also put into these, um, these notebooks that they keep. They also learn about human anatomy and do their own drawings, just like Leonardo did. They look at the human face and the expressions on faces. One thing uh, Leonardo liked to do was uh, follow odd looking people down the street and ask them 
if he could draw them. And uh, I'm sorry. To peel the stick. I'm sorry. Can you all hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed the question. Was there a question? No, okay, I'm gonna continue, but jump in if you have a question. So um, in the classroom, um, you would have these wonderful resources of these books we have on Leonardo. We have a great library. And you would do a number of these same exercises inspired by the kind of drawings that Leonardo did in his own notebooks. Uh, one of the things is just drawing from nature, drawing from observation. You see his quote here, it's important to go right to nature. Um, so drawing um, natural objects is something students will do. They'll also um, put mathematics in this sketchbook because um, obviously Leonardo, he was an architect and, and um, the whole um, innovation of using perspective was, was a Renaissance idea. Uh, so students do one point and two point perspective in their notebooks. And um, I should notice, you, you might also notice that um, in some of these uh, examples I'm showing you, they write backwards. That was something that Leonardo also did. And then they'll use a computer, a computer program called um, Geometry Sketchpad to understand uh, the perspective that exists in the Renaissance paintings and really analyze it mathematically. Um, I should mention the other thing they do in the Leonardo book is they actually draw dissections. They do dissections and draw uh, and label them just as Leonardo did. As you know, he would um, uh, often engage in drawing you know, human dissections to understand how the human body functions. So that's an example of a project that the art teacher teaches it, but so does the science teacher and so does the history teacher. Everybody's in it together and the book becomes kind of a demonstration of the student's understanding of what it is to be a Renaissance person. Now I'm going to just go through some other examples of what happens in the art program at the Ross School. In addition to the integrated arts, which every student takes every year, and it's a different focus depending on what they're studying. They also have an opportunity to take art electives in drawing, painting, printmaking, architecture, sculpture, digital thinking, um, woodworking, a whole range of uh, electives. So I'm just gonna show you some examples of work by Roscoe students. Um, here's some examples of self-portraits. It gives you a sense of both the, the skill of some of these artists and you know the sort of range of students that we have. And um, like the, these were done with using stencil, for example. Um, this was a large scale self-portrait that had a lot of collage in it. Uh, this one's done in watercolor. This one were uh, portraits where they did their profiles and then they also in, in uh, each work they had to show a lot of different ways of working. So they use uh, spray paint, they use stencil, they actually even use weaving. They cut into the paper and wove paper in it and they use another uh, number of other methods too. So the idea of trying different things is, uh, is really encouraged at Ross School. There's some more examples of that assignment. So you wouldn't think of these as a traditional portrait but they actually represented some of the passions or, and experiences of the students that made them. Uh, we do life drawing at the Ross School. This is one of the Ross School studios. You can see um, where we've got a, a model uh, and the students are doing gesture drawings. Here's some examples of gesture drawings, which are you know, very fast drawings done from like uh, you know, three or four minute poses. This is using ink, charcoal. And then, you know, one of the ways that I will um, critique it with the students is we'll put all the work up and then we'll go around and attribute uh, certain adjectives or descriptions to each of the works. 
Here's an example of a drawing that was done with a charcoal pencil. It was actually done with the student taking photographs of her own hands and then drawing them. This would be an example of the kind of work you'd see in a portfolio. This student actually ended up going to RISD and this was part of her uh, college portfolio. So obviously uh, a drawing like this can take a lot of time. She also did it with uh, a skeleton. So this kind of intense observational drawing is, is you know, among the things that we've taught at Ross School. Um, here's some other ones, sometimes more unusual ways of drawing, the idea of wrapping something up and then trying to guess what's inside of it and doing a drawing of it. Jen, we have a question um, uh, from one of the students in the session. What do you teach and what do you think is more important to teach? Techniques such as skill of shading or ideas and conceptions and right way to express and exhibit them? What an excellent question. That's a great question. I realize I'm starting with these pretty traditional observational drawings, but as I move through this presentation, you'll see that, um, you know, what really matters is a student's point of view and, and how they can present something that is new and fresh and related to their vision. So um, I think you'll see some examples of that. We also have a museum studies course and an exhibition program and um, uh, graphic design classes a lot of emphasis on how to present your work, how to uh, uh, share your ideas. So I'm going to continue on and um, we'll move up and maybe that will um, answer your question a little more fully. So this was just one student's work. This is a student, you know, that created a consistent body of work of these objects that he sort of thought of as architecture, really. Um, here is um, a work that's, can you guys tell what this is done on? I know, Sophie, you know the answer. Do the rest of you know what this is? What is this painted on? Um, computer component? Yeah, it is. It's a hard drive from a computer. So that kind of gives it a little thing, you know, the idea that these were three friends, but, you know, maybe she's commenting on how they stay together and communicate through technology. I'm not quite sure, but it's kind of an interesting and unusual choice of material. Um, you know, stencils are one way students like to express themselves. So you make a drawing and then you can turn it into a stencil. And here's other examples of that. Um, photography is a big um, uh, elective here. And um, we do both dark room, dark room photography and digital photography. Here's a few examples. Uh, design, the idea of furniture design or um, architectural design, interior design, fashion design, all these uh, courses are taught here. Oops, I got him twice. Uh, this is sculpture that was made out of some, um, what do you call it, uh, test tubes. We have a veterinarian near the school and he donated uh, these um, to us. And so uh, the idea of making art out of any kind of object is something you'll see students do quite a lot. Is it Dadaism? Dada, Dada is a great thing uh, that we do teach in the 11th grade. Sophie, you can probably speak to that, right? Yeah, it's um, where you make a collage and then you, like you cut an image out and then you draw what you think that like, you draw another image that you think would go with the photo. And it's yeah, sort of- it's the whole idea of, um, you know, kind of almost being nonsensical or, yeah. or uh, irrational juxtapositions of forms to kind of create new meaning. And it's certainly something the Dada artists did and then the Surrealists also did it. So in 11th grade, when we study modern art, the students make a lot of work related to that. Um, we also have sculpture class. Here's an example. Uh, we have um, uh, portrait sculpture and figure sculpture. We have printmaking. We have a beautiful printing press where the students, um, you know, can carve and print on a, on a just an exquisite um, French press. And uh, here's a student that won an award in a local exhibition. There's a lot of um, opportunities for students to exhibit their work near Ross School. There's this is at the Longhouse, which is a world-renowned uh, uh, sculpture garden that has a student art show every year. And there's also a couple of um, museums that also feature student artworks. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about our gallery. 
Um, at the Ross School, we have a gallery that students can curate exhibitions, uh, both of their own work and the work of professional artists. And uh, we also use it for our senior projects. Um, I, I'm flipping here to kind of give you an idea of what the Ross School looks like. We're surrounded by these um, reproductions of works of art from all over the world. And students uh, understand the significance of these uh, artifacts and they use them in the study of their history. Um, here was a project kids did where they transformed a room into uh, the House of Mysteries from Pompeii. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the gallery a little bit. Here's a portrait show students curated and what it is, it's a work of professional artists who live in this community. There are so many artists that live in the Hamptons and some of them are world famous. And we have this program where we bring students to these studios and they actually meet the artists and then curate an exhibition of the artist's work in the gallery. So they get, you know, museum experience. They learn how to interview artists, how to install a show, how to create a catalog, how to give a tour. And, um, and they make their own art also for this space. Uh, this is an example of kids doing a show that demonstrated their understanding of Alexander the Great. And they were able to kind of do it in you know, their own way. Here's another exhibition of the work of professional artists from the community. And um, they will intermix it with their own artworks. Um, so the gallery space is, is, is a nice kind of place for students to express themselves. In this case, this was a show that the Museum Studies kids put together of student work. So they put together portraits from every grade and from every teacher um, and in every medium just to uh, kind of uh, bring it all together and share with the community. I'm gonna talk a minute about senior projects and um, senior projects, uh, every senior does a senior project. They get to choose a topic, they, it can be of their passion. Um, it doesn't have to be art, it can be science, or they might want to um, uh, start a, a business or um, do something related to mathematics. But uh, many students choose to do art pro projects or film projects. You have to make a process folio as you develop your project over four months and then you present it to the community and you also give an oral presentation. So your book might look something like this as you're gathering your ideas together. And then when you finally produce it, you become the expert on whatever it is. In this case, kid, kid did um, architectural details. Here's a boy that did dance, for example. Here's a girl that not only did dance, but she designed costumes based on Greek folk dances and performed them. So often the senior projects are interdisciplinary. They might have performance and they might have uh, writing, interview, uh, in this case, costume design. Here's a boy that did a graphic novel um, about uh, the, the quiet revolution in Portugal, something his grandparents knew about, so he interviewed them for it. And um, some students like to do uh, things related, other kinds of graphic novels. Music can be a senior project as well. Um, there was a girl that did a senior project on the theme of zombies. Uh, she wrote a book about a town being invaded by zombies. And then she created this zombie bedroom in the gallery space. So it gives you a lot of opportunity to do installations and you know do something you know, crazy. Um, here's a girl that her focus was on fashion, kind of pairing it with uh, paintings of distressed areas. My goodness, that empty background kind of looks like what New York is looking like now, isn't it? With no people in it. <laughs> um, but here you see just a way that people combine ideas. So when you were speaking about conceptual ideas or, uh, you know, work that's generated more from imagination. There's an awful uh, lot of opportunity for students to really go in their own direction. Here's a boy who loved big cats and he actually learned to weld this cat. And this was also a senior project. <laughs> and this was, uh, 
<laughs> um, some students make films. Uh, here's a boy who made an airplane based on the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci's flying machines. Here's a boy who did a performance piece that also included photography and ceramics and costume design based on Alice in Wonderland. And here's a girl that did an installation um, as part of her senior project. Uh, one of the things the students have done at Ross School, well, they do quite a lot of community service in different ways, but in this case, they did something called a memory project. It's an organization that pairs art students with kids who live in orphanages around the world. Our students paint the portraits of the children and then the portraits are sent to the children as gifts. These are examples of oil paintings done by some of my students. And then they're sent to the child and, and, and um, they've gotten back photos of the child holding the picture. Uh, the other thing that we do at Ross School is something called Field Academy. Uh, in some cases, it involves world travel and service all over the world. Uh, we've gone to Africa and, and South America and Asia. Um, but I do one that's based in New York City and also the uh, East End. In this case, uh, here is the class at, in Brooklyn um, where we were doing a concentration looking at mural painting. And then the students painted their own mural. This is a mural that is about endangered animals. So they design it together, uh, paint it together. And um, yeah, they, they uh, find out what it's like to do that. We have, a, we have kind of a um, well-known muralist that comes every year and does a mural with the students. And here are students working in that classroom on a mural. Here's some of the students. This one was on the topic of uh, justice. Um, you see Malala over there in the corner, the uh, girl that won the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, who uh, is from Afghanistan. And this was a recent one we did. Sophie, who's joining us here in the chat, was part of it. The theme uh, this year was artists' studios. So we visited a lot of artists in their studios. And, um, and then we created this mural at the end, kind of documenting everything that we did and saw. So it's a little crazy image, but actually it's meaningful to the kids that were involved with it because each uh, picture represents something that they experienced in visiting the certain artists, interviewing them, seeing how they live and work. And then I'm just closing with this one, which is I asked my uh, students who are teaching online now, because of the virus, but I asked my advanced students to send me an image um, that reflects the virus, either uh, literally or metaphorically, and these are two that were sent back to me. The first one was done in watercolor, and the second one was done digitally. So I should mention at the Ross School, there are a lot of opportunities to work digitally in uh, graphic design and in visual thinking, and um, we have a whole program called iLab, where students can code, they can, they can uh, you know, develop ways of making art through technology. And that's all I have for right now. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm here to answer questions. I'm really interested in each of you and telling me your own experience with art and, and uh, what you like to do and, and any questions that you have. Um, can I have a question? Yeah, go ahead, Allie. Um, do you keep any sketchbooks and what do you usually write or join them? Oh, well, I have a whole PowerPoint on sketchbooks I could have showed you. That's a great question. Every student should have a sketchbook and believe it or not, art colleges really like to still see them. It's really important to them because they're more free form. You can draw what you see, but you can draw what you imagine. You can try different materials. What do you like to do in your sketchbook? Um, I like just, you know, kind of like doing notes. Sometimes I draw it and just doodling. What I can show you. Um, or is that you see let, me, let me click on and see if I can see. Ah, very nice. Well, that's exactly what they should be. They should be kind of um, stream of consciousness, draw every day. 
Mm -hmm. I always advise my students to draw every day. Um, you know, e even if it's just for 20 minutes, because in the end it can really add up if you do that. Well, that's cool. Well, how about the rest of you? Do you like to keep sketchbooks or do you have questions? I mean, I keep sketch um, sketchbooks at home and it's like weird to look back on them. It's like, oh, like that's what I felt like when I drew this. Yeah, I advise you to always date your, your drawings in your sketchbook too. You think you're gonna remember when you did them, but maybe you won't. But I still have sketchbooks that I did when I was in high school and you know, I'm pretty old. Oh, uh, it, is, it is a great sort of uh, history. Um, of, you know, it's a great thing to look back on. What about you, Dana? Do you keep sketchbooks? Is Dana here? Oh, maybe she doesn't have her mic on. Yeah, not everyone has their mic on. Um, oh, okay. oh, yeah, she doesn't, I see. Mm -hmm. But if she wanted to talk, I wonder if she knows how to turn her mic off. Yeah. I mean, turn, turn it so it's free. Um, um, Sophie, can you um, talk about a couple of the electives you've taken at Ross? Um, I've taken... Last year, I took acting and drawing, and I also, last year, I took advanced drawing and um, coding. And then I took uh, dance and graphic design. And then this year, um, I'm doing AP uh, literature, and um, I took... I haven't taken an art class this year, um, but I have taken a lot of art classes last year. And you just finished the, um, you know, you just finished the Field Academy, which was an art focus class. Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, do you have a um, modernity project you're working on and is it an artistic medium? Um, yeah, um, it has to do with performing arts. I um, am doing a tap dance and I'm doing it with like early, um, late 19th century and early 20th century music and the tap dance is um, influenced by the early and 20th century. Awesome. To um, fill the students in on what modernity projects are, it's um, a project that happens in 11th grade and it's sort of in a way kind of a lead up to um, how you would treat your senior project which Jen talked about a little bit um, and the modernity project is it's uh, it's like a culminating project and you kind of choose something from the time period um, I forget Jen what is the time period they're they're looking at 18, 18 uh, 16 to 1930 and so they choose something that happened during that time period, like, um, you know, the emergence of the flappers or um, abstract art or um, the combustion engine or, um, you know, assembly line production in factories or um, advances in medicine and science. And they choose uh, something they're passionate about and then they do a project that's based around um, that and it's usually interdisciplinary, right? And a lot of choose, mm -hmm. students choose, um, you know, very creative projects. Like, I mean, you're talking about a performing arts project, and I've seen a lot of uh, visual arts projects based around um, that time period. So, I don't know if Jen has anything to add about that. No, that that is it's kind of like a um, tryout senior project. It's a chance for you to direct. Um, to direct yourself and um, and uh, you know do something you really care about. Um, are you guys hearing me okay? Because I'm getting a message that my internet is weird. Yeah, Can you hear me? You're fine. Okay. Um, do you mind if I share something else just for a minute to answer Ali's uh, question yep. on the screen? Uh, she was mentioning about senior projects. I mean uh, sketchbooks. I'm just going to show you a few, okay? Because um, I. Um, I found one here that we can kind of present. Let's see. Uh, 
I'm sorry, let me just get it up, play from the, from the start. Oh, I didn't really want to show all of this. I'm going to flip over to the sketchbook part. Um, okay, so sketchbooks at Ross School, you know those little moleskin, moleskin sketchbooks? I don't know if you, any of you have ever used those, but um, mm -hmm. they're small. They're like five by seven inches and I start off by having students just fill them with lines, examples of different lines and mark making, maybe making collages of different kinds of lines. And then I ask them to do a, a, put in a lot of artist quotes and also do little uh, sketches of uh, just gesture drawings of people sitting in the cafe, sitting in your room. I have students do a lot of master copies just to kind of learn from other artists and learn how to work. Uh, these ones are by, um, from Picasso. This is Gustav Klimt, Egon Schiele. I have them do little master pages where they learn about artists. They write their names and little in biographical information about them. And, you know, it's just kind of a, rather than just take straight notes, it's a way of kind of, you know, creating some art history references, but your own way. Can you see that this is the book turned sideways here? And um, there's other kind of little prompts I give them. This is a little decal. I will ask them to stamp it onto their book and then draw from the pen a, their own kind of drawing. Can you see the one over here? There's, you know, there's so many different ways to go to just get people started, to get people to start to draw. Uh, uh, someone was mentioning Dada. This is, would be an example of that, just taking some random images and then somehow turning them into a new picture. Here's one where the sketchbook was burned. Can you see that hole in it? And then when you turn the page, you see another picture. So these sketchbooks can really be manipulated and you, know, you can even burn them with a match or cut them with the scissors or make a little window. I've also had students do things uh, prompt by a statement. This one was teacher, Ross teacher by day, superhero by night. And they would have to figure out a way to illustrate it. Um, I did an assignment where they did something called um, an alien in a chair. This is from the Bauhaus, a uh, famous photograph of a Bauhaus you know, mask and a Bauhaus chair. And they made their own um, aliens sitting in the chair. You know, it doesn't really matter what you do in your sketchbook. The point is, is that you're just working your own way. You're recording things. You're making notes. You're writing phone numbers down. In this case, the paper was cut. And you can see, you can turn the page. Here's another prompt, gas main explosion in Greenwich Village. Sometimes I get the, um, the headlines from the newspaper. You can take an old sketchbook or an old paperback and draw on it. And so... Now I'm going to stop. But that was just a little bit of an idea of what can go into a sketchbook. So the answer to what can go into the sketchbook, anything. Mm -hmm. um, have Sometimes you ever held an exhibition? Pardon? Um, sorry. Um, have you ever held an exhibition? Um, an exhibition of my own or for the students? Or of your what own? You, and could you my tell own? Me? experiences, yes. If you oh, have. yeah, no. Uh, thank you. That's a nice point, Ali. You know, um, I think um, uh, Miss Larson was mentioning it in the last session. The thing about the Ross School is all the teachers that, that teach at the Ross School are professional artists, and they all have had exhibits in New York City and out here, and they've had um, experiences living and working as artists, and, and we all have studios, and we all are uh, producing artists. So that's kind of an important thing. Yeah, I have my own studio and um, actually the whole Roscoe faculty just had an exhibition uh, right, near he right near the school in Southampton. And so the answer to that's yes. I think it's important for the teachers to be making art as well as teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. in just um, the level of relevance that a practicing artist brings to their teaching um, and, you know, also in the way that you as the faculty help students prepare their portfolios for college, um, you know, college recruiters, um, 
it just, it's amazing. And you're also connected. And I think that's another point about our, the location of Ross School is that, you know, we're in this uh, sort of resort area adjacent to New York City. We're, you know, we're two hours from New York City. So you have a lot of artists who, you know, had fled the city or you currently, currently and in the past, like you were talking about Jackson Pollock. Um, and, you know, they come out here to, you know, breathe the fresh air and have studio space and, you know, to paint and, and sculpt and do whatever. Um, so there's a very rich um, community of artists out here that I don't think you find everywhere. I mean, every community has its artist's colony or its artist, you know, its lane of galleries or whatever on, off of Main Street, but um, there's such a huge and, and wide ranging um, bunch of artists out here it's it's so inspiring and i feel like our you know our um faculty are so connected to them that you know even when there's a seventh grade curated show you know you have famous artists literally showing up to see that mm -hmm. and interacting with our students and that's just amazing um the other thing that i will point out about the school that's really different is you know we're such a young school um you know we're about 27 years old and as such, we're not steeped in tradition. So, you know, it's nice to see how things have evolved over time. And, um, you know, our, I think our arts program is so um, representative of the way we think about, about um, solving global problems and preparing you for the future is, you know, it's, it's about problem solving and being creative and creativity is, you know, is the current capital. Um, so I think it's an important thing to get across is that, you know, we value creativity and innovation like so much. And it's just so much a part of, of the Ross mission is, you know, creating global citizens and being creative problem solvers because the world is always changing as we've seen, especially in the last few weeks, it's always changing and how we adapt to it is, you know, defines who we are. And I think as a school, that's always been um, very important to us. I also think if you have many passions in like art and like science that like at Ross you're able to combine them, which I think not many other schools can do. Right. Yeah, definitely. Do you mind if I share one more thing real quick? Go for it. Okay. Um, I don't want to monopolize the uh, conversation here. We're but, here to uh, hear from you, Jen. <laughs> I know. I want to hear from the rest of you, though. I, but I thought since we were talking about um, about artists that um, I live in the area and that the students have an opportunity to meet, um, that it would be nice to show you some. Are you seeing my screen right now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to try to get up. Um, how do I get? Oh, I can say play from current slide. Okay. So, um, so uh, here's an artist, for example, that the students met and interviewed. His name was Morgan Monceau, and he had actually been a homeless man who was discovered by a local gallery dealer, and they found out that he had done 100 portraits of, um, of uh, jazz singers, and he had done all the United States presidents. And because of that, this man who discovered him made a book uh, about his work and the students got to meet him and put him in the show that I was showing you before called Portraits. So um, they were able to find out from him how for him, uh, he, uh, they get artist quotes from each of the artists. He said that art had saved his life. Um, here is one of the, the uh, sculpture shows that the students put together. And when, uh, now I don't know if you know, but if you see the sculpture on the left, it's by somebody named John, uh, or, um, uh, John Chamberlain, very, very famous artist. His work is in museums all over the world, but he, he lived a neighbor. in Shelter Island. What? Yeah, he was my, my dad's neighbor. He was he, and here he is now. Here you can see the students interviewing him. And like, this is what his studio looked like. Now I will tell you, you know, people would love to go to his studio and he doesn't let people go to his studio. But when I called him up and asked, could I bring a group of students? He said, yes. And so they got a chance to see that. Um, here is an artist who uh, we went to her studio and her studio was half indoors and half outdoors. 
and she showed us how uh, to weld. She welded right in front of us. And um, here's another studio, uh, artist that would actually come and work with the students and do workshops so the students can make their own work. Here's another artist named John Alexander. Again, these are kind of, uh, you know, world famous artists. So that's it, that's all I wanted to share. Just the idea that we get access to some of these amazing studios. I was looking the other day at a video I had of Roscoe students visiting Roy Lichtenstein. And what's so special about this is, you know, you're getting an opportunity to meet artists, some who are young and just starting out and some who are, you know, very established. And, you know, maybe they're not gonna be, many of the artists I just showed you aren't, aren't, aren't around anymore. So you're getting to meet them at, you know, be, before they're gone. And it's kind of a very special opportunity to meet artists of these different generations, you know, while they're still here, while, while you can still talk to them and meet them and learn from them and be inspired by them. So it's a unique place, the Ross School for that. It's, um, you know, not only in the arts, but there's wonderful writers that um, live here and um, uh, musicians as well. So it's very much a lively and uh, vital art community. And um, you feel that when you're walking the halls of the Ross School. There's kind of art everywhere. There's a sense of creativity and um, excitement and passion. And you get to be inspired by each other. And the fact that we have students from all over the world is, is such a plus because they bring so much. Don't you agree with that, Sophie? To have yeah. people from all over the world? Yeah, like I have friends from like Ukraine and Germany and it's cool to like see how their point of view. And you stay in touch too. I mean, you end up having yeah. worldwide friends. Think about that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so many of the students who've gone to Ross School have gone on to do some pretty amazing things, make films, uh, make graphic novels, become fashion designers. And um, yeah, so it's very cool. Liz, since you're here, uh, Liz Dobbs from our, um, she's our executive chef is here also on the call. Do you have anything to add, Liz? Hi, sorry, I'm <laughs> That's okay. I'm getting ready to go shopping with my mask on. Um, no, I just, I really enjoyed the um, Jen's uh, talk about art. I mean, I really, I'd like to keep in touch with the whole school. Of course, my staff feeds everybody at the school. Right, Sophie? So, yeah. um, <laughs> so we really miss feeding everybody. And we, you know, it, it's, Listen, cooking is an art and it's also a science. So we try to keep um, upon the trends of, of the world and, and, and in the community. So we're, we, miss, we miss it. We miss kind of being at work every day and, and contributing. So, and- uh, Glad to have you here. <laughs> and if you all are following us on Instagram and or Facebook, we have um, one of Chef Dobbs favorite uh, easy vegan chocolate cake recipes going up on Online uh -huh. tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So take a look for that. Right, sure. Very yeah. Cool. yeah, bye. Thanks again, Jen, and everyone stay Liz, safe. Uh, yeah, Liz, thank you. I mean, one of the things you guys will know about the Ross School is not only do we have amazing organic, regional, sustainable food every day, but Liz often will do cultural meals based on um, the student study of Islam or China and, and make these amazing foods from recipes from around the world. So, I mean, who has that? You know, it's such a rare and special thing. So mm -hmm. we're really fortunate to have great food and we get to learn about culture from the food as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liz. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Good. Good. Does anyone have any more questions or anything to add? Good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, well, if you have any questions afterwards, you can always email Jen Cross, it's jcross at ross.org, or you can email the admissions office, admissions at ross.org. And I want to thank you all for coming today. Congratulations on your acceptances, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, we yeah. hope we all see you in the fall. Thanks. Yeah, see you soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.